Adam Grant stated that the great shapers of humanity do not stop in introducing originality into the world, but they create cultures which unleash originality in others. I am very passionate about unleashing originality in my students, in my team members, and my fellow academic colleagues. We work in an area which is called regenerative medicine. And our ultimate goal is to restore function in patients which have lost their tissue either through an accident or via a disease. In regenerative medicine, there is a great move to introduce interdisciplinarity in the research programs as well as in the scholarships. However, most of the teams are rather doing multidisciplinary research, which does not lead to what we have done in the past, moving a bone tissue engineering concept into the clinic. So what I hope you take away from this talk is that interdisciplinarity is not a virtue. That if you walk the talk in interdisciplinarity, we can change all facets of life. And not only that, but also what we do and also who we are. Unfortunately, Often, interdisciplinarity is used interchangeably with multidisciplinarity. However, they are different by definition. So multidisciplinary means that people with different disciplines working together, each drawing on their own discipline and their knowledge. However, they do not have a common goal to reach something. Whereas interdisciplinary really means integrating that knowledge and methods for different disciplines using a real synthesis of an approach to achieve something. So socio-economical studies and business cases show us that interdisciplinary teams are much more effective than multidisciplinary teams. However, as you all know, very similar as families, teams can be working brilliantly together, but they can be also totally dysfunctional. So what we see often in multidisciplinary research groups, they still act like silos, and they are not creating an open and social arrangement in where students and team members can become the future learners to solve the big problems of the world. Neurosciences teaches us that our perception is not coming out of the blue. It is a result of processing every day thousands of communication cues, sending and receiving so how do we learn interdisciplinarity? So I was very fortunate that during my time at the National University of Singapore, I was visited by a Singaporean technocrat. And he did visit my lab, and then he told me and my team that his vision was to attract the best expatriate faculty around the world because he thought that creativity is not taught, but caught. So very similarly, we can now argue that interdisciplinarity, to walk the talk, we need role models. For me, as a young German undergraduate student, I was very fortunate to be accepted into the lab of one of the pioneers of a field which is called artificial organs, which started 40 years earlier than regenerative medicine. Professor William Kolff. He had 
a large institute at the University of Utah. And as I was one of his students working on my thesis, I could observe firsthand how he would not only compile, but also mentor interdisciplinary teams composed of engineers, scientists, and surgeons. And what he did is that he showed us every day that the team should focus on critical thinking, on process, on solutions, and not make the discipline key. So, this is also what we do in my lab at QUT. We are an interdisciplinary team. I also have students which come with a background of engineering, science, and I also have surgeons in my team. So our team has been working very closely with the surgical team on this patient case. And here you see some of the team members, Dr. Marie Wille, Nathan Castro, both postdocs in my lab, uh, Beat Schmutz, and the PhD student, Sebastian Eggert. They worked relentlessly for two months together with Dr. Wegels on producing, based on the CT imaging and MRI scans, not on only making these models which show the defect of the patient, but also designing this patient-specific scaffold, and this is a size of 37 centimeters. So we use this printer which you see here to produce the models as well as the different designs of the scaffold. The scaffold is highly porous. However, in my lab, of course, I cannot produce a scaffold which goes into a patient. For that, we needed another team member, which was a company in Singapore, which is a medical device company, which we also communicated on a weekly basis based on our designs, because they have the certified facility then to 3D print a scaffold, an implant, which can go into a patient. Did we stop here? No. Based on these very successful results, and we are very happy to report that Ruben, now after one year, has a lot of bone formation, and he's putting 25% of his body weight on his operated leg. However, we will only know after two or three years the full outcome. But the very encouraging results allowed us to treat now more patients in Germany. Now we have to translate our interdisciplinary concept across the ocean. So here you see Dr. Boris Holzapfel, who is an orthopedic surgeon who did a PhD with me from 2012 to 2050. Then he went back to the biggest orthopedic hospital, one of the biggest orthopedic hospitals in Germany, and he also treated patients last year based on our results here in Brisbane. So he treated a tumor patient. So what you see here is a large bone tumor which had to be removed. This is a CT scan and X-ray. This is the MRI scan. We needed to regenerate that bone also. So one of the big challenges was, of course, that Boris wasn't present as Dr. Wiggles here. So we had to work across the globe via uh, Skype, WhatsApp, and sending models back and forth. But another very big challenge we faced was that the patient Boris had did weigh 120 kilograms. This is double of the weight of Ruben, the patient we treated here in Brisbane. So that's a very big biomechanical problem we had to face in respect to which design of this metal implant should be used. So again, our interdisciplinary team uses a lot what is called computational modeling. That we can simulate now what's happening when we put an implant like this into the bone, into the defect, and the patient would put load on it. And that allowed us to find the ideal implant for the German patient. And again, as I said, we produced a series of models to plan 
the surgery, to simulate the surgery. And here you see now, this is a tumor which is more than 16 centimeters, which has been removed for this patient, right? And this is the outcome now. Here you see now the follow-up. This is the tumor. This is now the defect which had to be created to remove the tumor. And here you see after three months, there's already some bone coming. And Boris didn't use as uh, Michael a vascularized flap. He used the bone graft, which also works. And here you see now after 12 months that the bone is further remodeling. But as I said before, this will also take another two to three years until it's completely remodeled. However, these x-rays do not tell us anything about the functional loading the patient can put on this operated leg. And here you see now the gait analysis of the patient. And again, the patient weighs more than 120 kilos. And you see him walking here already after three months, also putting about 20-30% of his body weight onto the operated leg. He was back to work after three to four months, but now after 12 months, you see he's putting his full body weight on this operated leg, and he is almost functioning normal again in his daily life. So let me now also bring another aspect of the 3D printing field, which is called bioprinting, the difference between multi and interdisciplinarity. So there are a lot of bioprinting groups around the world which state that they can print a tissue or an organ. However, that is not possible. What we can do is we can print in a bio-ink cells. But then these cells have to multiply. They have to produce extracellular matrix, which is the building block of our tissues. And again, the wrong perception is, if I would ask you, do you think when you put workers on a construction site, just by putting the workers there, the building would come up? Obviously not. The workers would need tools, they would need equipment, and most importantly, they would need the time to build the building. And very similar, the 3D printing process, the printing of cells, is just the start of then, over a long period of time, to have the biology directing now that the cells produce the tissue. So that's very important. And again, only if you have an interdisciplinary approach where this biology is included, we will be successful in regenerating tissue one day in the laboratory. So, communication is very important in academia. So, I hope what I could show you that an interdisciplinary approach can not only change many facets of our life and for patients, but sometimes it can make the impossible possible. In our case, the prevention of the amputation of the leg of a young father.